This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Jennifer Saunders and Judy Dench star in the film adaptation of Alan Bennett's Alleluia. Set in 2019, geriatric hospital The Bethlehem in Wakefield, Yorkshire, known affectionately as The Beth, is facing closure. For now, the staff, including Jennifer Saunders's head nurse, Sister Alma Gilpin, and Bally Gill's Dr. Valentine, take care of their elderly patients as usual, including Judy Dench's Mary, Derek Jacobi's Ambrose, and David Bradley's Joe Coleman, whose son Colin, played by Russell Tovey, is a consultant to the health minister advising on budget cuts. With Alma about to receive a medal for her long-standing service, and a crew producing a documentary on the Beth, can the hospital be saved? Alleluia is based on Alan Bennett's 2018 play of the same name. You might be familiar with Bennett's work as he's previously written The History Boys and The Lady in the Van, both of which were translated from stage to screen. The adaptation is by Heidi Thomas, who previously has had massive success on television, being the creator of the enduring call The Midwife. The film is directed by Richard Eyre, a veteran British director whose credits include Iris and notes on a scandal, so this sees him re-teaming with Judy Dench once again, and aside from her, the film is filled with heavyweight British acting talent, including Derek Jacobi, Jennifer Saunders, Russell Tovey, David Bradley, all these big names attached to this movie, which makes it all the more bewildering why Alleluia is such a misfire. Now I have to admit that I have skin in the game here because I have family that has worked in this particular area. In fact, they wanted to see the movie, so I actually took them with me when I went and saw it because I was planning to review it anyway and I wanted to hear their insights. I wanted to know how accurate the film was in portraying this particular world. I got my answer fairly shortly into the screening because they were not enjoying it. They were actually fairly distracted at how inaccurate the movie's portrayal of this particular area of care was, but especially in terms of technical details, like the way that they would hold them and escort them out of their beds. On several occasions, the doctors and nurses in the film hold their patients in ways that would not only potentially injure the patients, but also injure themselves as well. Those are not the techniques that are used in modern hospitals. And that was generally the recurring criticism that I got from them in that it didn't feel like a hospital circa 2019 with all the standard health and safety that you would expect. It felt like a hospital from the 1970s. That complaint didn't surprise me in the slightest. In fact, I actually expected it because I do think that a lot of British media does have a kind of romanticised, almost nostalgic nature about it, where it feels like it's looking more back at the past, even when it's meant to be in the present. And so that didn't surprise me that a movie that is largely aimed at an older audience isn't really accurate to how things actually are, but it is already a failing for a movie which is meant to be depicting the way the NHS is right now. Maybe some of this could be forgiven if Alleluia worked as drama, but a lot of the time it really doesn't. I was actually relieved when they said they weren't enjoying the movie because I wasn't either, largely for different reasons, because on a narrative level the film is really rough, especially in the first act. You have this whole documentary crew that's set up very early on in the movie, and that's largely there to have the characters introduce themselves directly into camera and explain who who they are, which sounds as stilted and as obvious as you can imagine. I don't know if this is something that was directly ported over from Bennett's play, but either way, it doesn't work especially well. What would have been better is just simply introducing themselves over the course of establishing the status quo at the hospital. That would have fit the tone of the movie better, but instead we get this very, very awkward introduction to all the characters, and that largely sets the tone for the movie, especially because it struggles to establish a pacing or rhythm. The story in Alleluia is seemingly 
non-existent. But that's not really a problem. A movie like this doesn't have to have loads and loads of plot. It has to be, though, compelling. The movie's largely hopping from one character at the hospital to another, but it never feels like it flows together especially well. It feels disjointed. You get one scene with one character and they'll hop onto someone else and you won't see that first character for an extended period of time. And that also means that you don't get to build up an emotional attachment to a lot of the characters. This means that that cast actually gets quite wasted over the course of the film, particularly Derek Jacobi, who largely he tries to add some comic relief uh, as an elderly teacher who's afraid of death. But perhaps the biggest name that gets squandered in this movie is Judy Dench, who I imagine is only in this film because Air is directing it. But she's largely an extended cameo in this film. She plays a former librarian. There are long periods of time where Dench completely disappears off screen, and it's a really nothing part for her to play. There is very little that actually challenges Dench at all in this movie, and she barely has about 10 minutes of screen time. By far the most successful of the story strands is the father-son one between David Bradley and Russell Tove. It's implied that their relationship has been estranged for quite some time, and it gradually heals over the course of the film. But the first time that Tove visits Bradley in the hospital, it's very tense, especially because Bradley's character is quite bigoted and homophobic. He disapproves of the fact that his son is in a relationship with another man, as well as the fact that he's working for the Conservative government. Bradley's character used to be a minor. He remembers when they were on the strike lines picketing. There's a moment that Drew laughs of a distinctly unintentional variety where they're talking about this and Tove says, well, no one strikes anymore, Dad. Which, given the current state of affairs in the UK, where there are loads of strikes, couldn't have landed with a more resounding clang if it tried. That line was so egregiously tone-deaf, it was ridiculous. They do gradually start to form a bond again because Tove used to be on those lines with him. They used to have him sing to encourage the other strikers. And there's a moment where Tove takes Bradley's character out in a wheelchair and he starts singing again, something that he probably hasn't done for quite some time. And it's actually a genuinely moving moment. It's the kind of thing that you wish that Alleluia had more frequently throughout it. As you would expect from Bennett, this is a very political movie. Yes, on one hand, it is a celebration of the AHS and what it does for its people, but it is also a staunch criticism of the Conservative government, the one that has sat in power for over a decade now, constantly chipping away at the AHS's budget and having to make them stretch for every single penny. And Tove's character largely exists for others to tell him about the effect that those policies have had. There are moments where he's guided to an empty hospital ward and he's being told about the fact that we can't open this ward because we can't afford to pay the staff and we can't afford to have the patients be in the bed. So we just have to have this closed off, even though it's perfectly capable of having patients in there. And Tove's character kind of tries to brush a lot of this off by saying, well, I'm a consultant. I don't make the policy. I merely give evidence for those in power to make those decisions, but he is the closest thing to a representative, and even he starts to do some soul-searching when he's confronted with the realities of what those decisions are. And there is a very staunch criticism about the fact that these kind of local hospitals they signify something. They're huge parts of their communities, but the decisions to close things like that happen many miles away and don't really consider those things at all. The movie's quite heavy-handed about this. It is not trying to be subtle. In fact, a lot of the time, it goes into outright speechifying, even though I broadly agree with the sentiment. Here's the thing. There have been a lot of commenters over the years that have left things like, oh, well, you only like that movie because you agreed with its politics. And Alleluia 
definitely refutes that particular claim because even though I do agree with a lot of what the film says about the conservative government and the state of the NHS, that does not mean that I think it's a good movie. In fact, I actually think it betrays that message later on. Elsewhere, we have Jennifer Saunders as Sister Gilpin watching over the ward, and Saunders is a bit of a national treasure over here. You think of things like Ab Fab or other comedic roles, she's very well loved. But this actually casts her quite against type. It's much more of a dramatic role than a humorous one. And Saunders acquits herself as well as she can do. The problem is the material fails her. I struggle to think of a time where Saunders has been less likeable on screen than she is in this movie. Even if we leave aside the ending for now, Sister Gilpin is a very sour character. It's established that she's been around for a very long time in the job. She's very old school and traditionalist, maybe even a little bit too long because her worldviews are quite jaded and nihilistic. At one point, she confides to Dr. Valentine, don't leave it too late to die. When I mentioned earlier about some of the staff talking to patients in ways they probably wouldn't be allowed to in real life, this is exactly who I was thinking of. Gilpin's bedside manner is spiky, to say the least. She often talks to patients in quite passive-aggressive ways. She's quite condescending in her overall manner, and that makes her very difficult to warm towards. And some of that is purposeful, but Saunders can't really do much with the part as written. And there were times where I thought to myself whether she was actually miscast in the role. In contrast, we have Dr. Valentine, played by theatre actor Bally Gill, who is making his film debut in this movie after a handful of television appearances. Dr. Valentine is a young doctor who loves caring for the elderly. He's very compassionate in his bedside manner. He always goes above and beyond for his patients. There's never a thing he won't do for them, despite the meagre funds of the hospital. Over the course of the story, he does actually manage to strike up a friendship with Sister Gilpin, despite the fact they have two totally contrasting worldviews, him as a young doctor and she as a nurse, almost on the cusp of retirement. Dr. Valentine also effectively serves as the film's narrator. He bookends the film and it's his emphatic positive worldview that is meant to be what we take away from this movie. He's so good-natured that it's almost unreal. He doesn't seem to have any kind of faults or flaws about him. Certainly, he doesn't seem to have any kind of interior life away from his job. And a lot of the time, it does seem like the character is more of a mouthpiece than an actual fully fleshed out figure. And maybe that wouldn't necessarily be entirely a problem if it weren't for the fact that I was also distracted by how much this almost felt like it was a stereotype. A lot of the time, Gil's performance actually reminded me of Dev Patel's performances in the best exotic Marigold Hotel movies, playing a very similar character who also idolises the idea of taking care of the elderly and building a hotel around it. It feels like Dr. Valentine is like some distant relation of that character. Let's talk about the marketing of Alleluia. I know that trailers aren't always representative of the films they advertise and more often show what the distributors wanted the film to be, but Alleluia is one of the most severe cases I can think of in quite some time. When the film released in the UK, the advertising was ubiquitous. It was blanket and everywhere. There were ads on the underground, TV spots, it was on the side of buses. You couldn't escape it. Let's look again at that poster with the big bright primary colours, especially for the title font, and that was the tone of all the advertising. Quotes about it being a pop banging success with upbeat, joyful music. The implication that this would be an uplifting, humorous look at older life. The reality is much different. The tone is not represented in those trailers at all. In fact, those trailers, I would almost argue, are a work of art. The way that they've managed to take things 
out of context and turn it into an almost completely different film is frankly astonishing. It takes almost all of the film's humorous moments and sandwiches them into two minutes to almost give the impression that it's a comedy. There is some humor in this movie, but it's more almost kind of gallows humor at times. And this wouldn't surprise you being an Alan Bennett thing because his plays do have a bit of a kind of morose, almost melancholic kind of variety to them. The marketing completely ill-prepared the audience for what they were about to see, because if they sold the movie as it actually was, no one would go and see it. The movie is trying to represent what it's actually like to be a frontline member of NHS staff, which is to say, a lot of the movie actually deals with incontinence. If you watched Alleluia, you might get the impression that 90% of the job is dealing with patients having wet themselves in their beds. It is such a major part of the movie that it's actually a full-on plot point. It's quite discomforting viewing, especially in one scene where a young carer played by Lewis Ashbourne Circus, Andy's son, deliberately withholds David Bradley from going to the toilet despite his pleas and wishes, so nature takes its course, which is a low-key disturbing scene, and that carer character suffers no strong consequences for that action. There are major repercussions of it, but not for him. And it's a scene that I found myself watching going, why is this in the movie? It's just weirdly unpleasant, like a lot of this movie is. And then we get the twist at the end of the movie, which is really when things go completely to hell. The last 15 to 20 minutes of this movie are absolutely jaw-dropping. It's like everyone involved with it completely had a leave of their senses simultaneously. And I know that this is something that is actually taken from Bennett's play, but it so feels completely wrong here. I don't know whether it was more successful on stage. I don't know whether something has shifted in the adaptation process, whether it was Ayer's direction or Thomas's screenplay or a combination of both, or whether because it's more steadfastly about supporting the NHS, this feels so wrong and so glaringly out of place, but it honestly feels like a total betrayal of what the audience has been expecting up until this point. There has been a story playing through this film. It's just been going on in the background, almost insidiously. You think that you're coming into this movie getting a joyful, uplifting time? Well, here comes the sting in the tail, and it runs down your spine like a scalpel. I'm just going to straight up spoil this twist because, frankly, there is no other way of talking about it. So near the end of the film, it turns out that Sister Gilpin has actually been murdering her patients all along. When they become incontinent, that's when Gilpin decides it's time to assist them in helping shuffle them off this mortal coil by giving them a nice warm jug of milk with an overdose of morphine. The movie takes this very dark, very disturbing tone extremely late into its running time, and then Gilpin is confronted about it. Judy Dench manages to catch it on her tablet, and she has no remorse about this at all. In fact, it's implied during the conversation that she has done this to maybe hundreds of patients over her tenure. It suddenly turns into the good nurse in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the movie, but at least that film wasn't extolling the virtues of the healthcare system before that point. It is so staggeringly ill-judged that it actually made me quite angry to watch it. I just genuinely couldn't believe what I was seeing, and yes, of course, the character ends up getting arrested, but that also means the hospital gets shut down 
as a result, but then the movie goes into an epilogue set in 2020 where Dr. Valentine is in a new hospital working on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. Yes, they just shoehorn that in there in the last five minutes of the movie. Derek Jacobi's character turns up simply to die from COVID with Valentine at his side. And as if you aren't shell-shocked enough from that tonal hairpin, suddenly Dr. Valentine starts monologuing directly to the camera, breaking the fourth wall and talking about how we should be taking care of the AHS because it will be there to take care of us when we're old. And I'm sat there watching this and I'm thinking, you cannot have the audacity to do this. You cannot have this just bolted on at the end of your movie like this and also have this kind of sermon preaching to the audience when literally less than five minutes ago Jennifer Saunders was getting carted out in a police car having been identified as a mass murderer. What is the message that we're meant to take away from this movie? Oh yeah, the NHS is great, it will look after you, apart from the odd ones that might attempt to bump you off? Even now the twist makes me so angry I can barely structure a coherent sentence together and I'm thinking of the person I'm sat next to and I almost want the ground to swallow me up and they were deeply upset and distressed by the ending as I'd imagine they would be given someone that has worked in that particular profession. Like how it depicts their work it made them feel embarrassed and ashamed of themselves. And I can't fathom how badly the movie fails in its primary objective to do that. And then I'm looking around at the audience, many of whom are elderly, several of which are disabled. There are several members in wheelchairs. And I'm thinking to myself, what do they take away from the ending? What do they take away from the twist? at the end of the movie. How do they feel given the marketing of the film, thinking that this is going to be a joyful, uplifting time, and then they get this, this, at the end of the movie. In fact, I know how they felt, because we actually sat all the way through the credits, because many of those audience members were so completely shell-shocked they could barely rise themselves out of their seats. Many of them looked like they were genuinely quite bewildered and actually quite disturbed by what they'd seen. Alleluia is one of the most unintentionally upsetting films I can think of in many, many a year. And it just made me so furious. So no, I don't recommend Alleluia. I don't think there are words strong enough to express my contempt for the last 15 to 20 minutes of this movie. I mean, before that point, it wasn't especially good. In fact, it felt more like a television drama than a theatrical release a lot of the time. And then it drops that on you. I mean, there's misjudged and then there's that. It's the kind of movie that far be it from giving you a positive opinion about the NHS or the health service, it's the kind of film that actually makes you deeply, deeply afraid of getting old. You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the colour tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some of my merch from my Tee Public page. Or you can take good care of my channel over at my Patreon, where you can see my videos early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.